Okay. Hello, everyone. I hope you are ready for a um, very interesting talk. Uh, unfortunately, I have to give the talk today. Professor Mudlu is uh, not here, not here today, neither tomorrow. And these two days, we are going to cover a very important topic of the course, or two important topics of the course. Uh, today, we will talk about SIMD processors. Tomorrow, about GPUs, which are, let's say, like the, a special form of uh, SIMD processors. Uh, why are they um, important, these two lectures? Uh, well, the reason is that, first of all, uh, we are going to complete this last part of uh, other execution paradigms. Uh, recall that everything started with the single cycle and the multi-cycle machine, and after that, we started studying uh, how to improve the performance uh, how to achieve higher throughput in the computing systems and different ways of doing this, uh, where pipelining, out-of-order execution. In the last lecture, Professor Mudlu talked about uh, very long instruction word architectures, about systolic arrays. These are, let's say, in this uh, category of other execution paradigms. And now we are going to cover uh, some of the most important uh, execution paradigms these days that are SIMD and uh, GPU. That's one reason why these two lectures are important. The other reason is that very likely you will have one or two questions related to uh, these two lectures in the final exam. You can actually check uh, last year uh, exam, uh, spring 2018, which is already in the website. Okay, so this is more or less what I already uh, said. And these are the readings for this week. Uh, the required one is uh, the first one, NVIDIA Tesla. This is an introduction to uh, the architecture of NVIDIA GPUs. It's quite uh, accessible paper, I would say, uh, quite easy to understand, and especially if you read it after today's and tomorrow's lecture. And the other one, it's also a very interesting one, uh, it's the, uh, but it's recommended. It's about the MMX uh, extensions, these multimedia extensions that we have in Intel processors since the, uh, well, um, end of uh, uh, the, the last century or the beginning of uh, the 2000s. And, um, and actually, we are going to talk about, the, about them uh, probably at the end of uh, today's lecture. With the lecture, CINDY processors and GPU, it's what we are going to cover today and tomorrow, and we start with CINDY processing. What is CINDY processing good for? It's good for exploiting data parallelism, and in particular, regular data parallelism. We are going to uh, talk about this um, during the whole lecture. Uh, but just to give you like a very, very uh, quick and uh, easy to understand example, uh, usually when uh, you are writing compute, I mean, uh, programming, writing your C code or whatever, you will see that many times you write a for loop and in this for loop you are going over an array and doing many times the same thing, right? Uh, so for example, the most uh, easy example to understand is you have two vectors and you want to add them element-wise. You want to add A0 with, uh, with uh, to B0 and store the result in C0, A1 plus B1 and store the result in C1, and so on. So there is a lot of parallelism there. Let's uh, assume that our uh, arrays or vectors have one million elements. So we could potentially be operating on these million elements at the same time. And why is that? Because uh, the computation that we need to apply to each of these elements, A0, B0, C0, A1, B1, C1, and so on, is completely independent, right? So why don't we design a machine that can operate on all these elements at the, at the same time? Unfortunately, it won't be possible to uh, design a machine with one million functional units, but maybe we can create a machine with uh, 128 functional units, and then what we will do is iterating 128 after 128, right? That's the, essentially the idea that uh, CINDY proce processors uh, um, use. So these uh, CINDY processors actually are one of the uh, four main categories of computer, computers that Mike Fling uh, introduced or discussed in his paper in 1966. 
The first uh, type is, uh, the first category are the CSD machines. This means single instruction, single data. This means that I have one single instruction and I go to memory and get one data element and operate on this data element. I do whatever this instruction says that I have to do. That's what a sequential machine does. Like what, if you, if you go to your laptop or to your cell phone and you look at the CPU that you have there, probably that, that CPU will be a multi-core CPU, but if you focus on just one single core of this, this will be a sequential machine, a SIMD machine that can only execute one instruction on one input data element, one, maybe one or two, right? Because we, if we are adding two elements, we need two input operands and we will get one uh, output. The second group are the uh, SIMD, single instruction, multiple data elements. And uh, these are the ones that we are gonna talk about. And as you will see uh, very soon, there are uh, two main types, array processors and vector processors. They are very similar. Uh, they have a lot of things in common, that's why uh, we explain uh, both uh, together. What's the main idea here? The main idea is that if I want to add these two vectors, A and B, and store the result in C, I just need one single instruction, add, add, and store, right? Just need one single instruction for the million elements. So that's why it's single instruction, multiple data. Um, another... Uh, the third category is MISD, is multiple instruction, single data. And it's not easy to find uh, computers or machine, machines which follow this uh, paradigm these days. Probably the closest thing is the uh, systolic array, are the systolic arrays that Professor Mudlu explained in the uh, last week. Um, another uh, example that you can also find maybe uh, uh, search uh, yourself are uh, microns automata processors. They are also kind of a uh, similar thing. And the last category are the MIMD, multiple instruction on multiple data. And uh, for example, I mean, I would say that the ECS example that we can uh, talk about here are multiprocessors, multi-core processors, or multi-threaded processors, uh, whatever you uh, want to call them, and uh, this is when we have uh, different threads of execution and each thread can be doing a completely different thing. Uh, tomorrow when we talk about GPUs, we will also uh, relate the, the way that uh, GPUs process instructions with uh, MIMD, because even though they are mostly SIMD, they, can, they also have some features that are related to, to MIMD. Okay, anyway, let's start talking about uh, SIMD. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, would a single data element refer to a data element as an array, for example, or as an integer? Yeah. Could you repeat? Uh, here it says on a single data element. Do you mean the smallest possible element, like an integer? Yeah, it's an, an, an scalar value, essentially. Mm -hmm. so an array, isn't it if it's an array, if we operate on an array, then it's a, a SIMD machine. Okay? Okay, uh, data parallelism. Let's define what we understand by uh, data parallelism. I think that uh, I somehow already defined that. Uh, but data parallelism, in data parallelism, the concurrency, that is the ability of execute several things, several instructions at the same time, or several operations at the same time, arises for, from performing the same operation on different pieces of data. That's SIMD, and the best example is the vector addition that I mentioned before. Another example uh, can be a dot product of two vectors, right? In dot product, I can also have some sort of uh, independent computation uh, on the different elements, at least for the multiplication part. For the accumulation, uh, yeah, we could discuss about that. We are not going to talk about that right now, but it's, it's uh, another possible example of uh, CMD computation. Uh, you have to contrast this regular data parallelism with something that has already been covered in the course as well. It's a data flow. In data flow, concurrency arises from executing different operations in parallel. And the computation can be completely irregular, right? This is uh, computation in a data-driven manner. And also contrast with 
threat or control parallelism. It's the example that I gave you before about the uh, multi-core uh, processors. In multi-core processors, we can have uh, individual threads running uh, on each of the cores, and they can be doing completely different things. Maybe they, these different threads uh, might belong to the same program, to the same process, or maybe even completely different processes, completely different applications. So uh, here in CIMD, we exploit operation level parallelism. Uh, we could say that it's a form of ILP, instruction level parallelism, uh, but not in the way that ILP is exploited, for example, in a very, low, very long instruction words architectures, right? Here, it's a much more simpler, simple, this uh, data level parallelism, because uh, the multiple instructions are essentially the same instruction on different data elements. Okay, a little bit more. Uh, single instruction operates on multiple data elements in time or in space. We are going to have multiple processing elements. You're going to see that in the next slide. And we say that we have a time-space duality. Uh, depending on if we operate on, let's say, time, or let's say we, we exploit this data, regular data parallelism in time or in space, we will be talking about array processors or vector processors. You have the definition here, but the best way to understand it is, is going directly to this slide. You can already observe the difference between these two array processors here on the left. They have, let's assume for now, four functional units or four processing elements. I will probably uh, use these terms uh, um, as um, uh, synonyms, right? Uh, processing element, computing element, process, uh, functional unit. I hope it's uh, always clear. So you have here four processing elements that are exactly the same. Each of, of them has a different number, index, of course. And here in the vector processor, you also have four processing elements, four functional units, but each of them is specialized. Uh, let's take a look at how uh, they execute the code, but first of all, let's take a look at the code. So here we have instruction string, four instructions. The first instruction is a load instruction, and we call it a vector load. Why is that? Because in the same access, when we execute the same one single instruction, we are reading, loading from memory more than one element. In this case, four. Okay, as you can see there, we are uh, go into where whatever array A is in memory, and we are getting four elements at the same time, A0, A1, A2, and A3, and we are storing them in a uh, vector uh, register. This vector register, you can think about it like a, a very, very long register, which is, in this case, divided into four slots, and in each of these slots, we are going to place A0, A1, A2, or A3. The uh, length of uh, each of these slots will be typically 32 bits or 64 bits, right? As usual in, uh, uh, I mean, the, the scalar registers that uh, we have studied in the LC3 or in, in MIPS. Uh, the second instruction is the uh, vector add. In this vector add, what we are doing is for uh, to each of these four elements that we have in the vector array, we are adding one. Next instruction is vector multiply. So we multiply by two each of these four elements. And finally, after having uh, done all the computation, we store the four elements at the same time uh, in memory. So how is this code executed in the array processor in the vector processor? So in the array processor, each of the processing elements can execute any type of instruction. First instruction is load. So the four uh, processing elements are loading from memory. One cycle later, let's say one cycle for now, probably this will take longer, right? At, at accessing memory, unfortunately, takes more than one cycle. But let's consider that this one cycle for now, we uh, execute the add instruction, and we do the add operation on the uh, four elements that we uh, previously loaded. After that, multiplication, and after that, uh, store operation. In the vector processor, because we have specialized functional units, we need to execute all the load operations in the same unit. So in the very first cycle, we issue load zero, as reading element A0, after that A1, and after that A2. But observe that as soon as we have read 
element A0, we can start executing this addition, right? That's why we see this add zero here in uh, functional uh, unit uh, add. So, and, and in the second cycle, while we are issuing uh, load two in um, functional uh, unit LD and the addition one in the uh, functional unit addition, we can start with the multiplication in uh, this third functional unit. So that's more or less uh, how it works. And uh, we will complete, after some cycles, we will complete the uh, execution of the entire code for the four uh, input, uh, input elements. Observe that here in the array processor on the left, we have the same operation at the same time. So uh, in any given cycle, in all the processing elements, we are executing the same operation while in the vector processor in the same cycle, we are executing different uh, operations. That's with regards to time, recall the uh, time-space duality, with regards to space in the uh, array processor, we have different operations in the same space, while we have the same operation in the uh, uh, same space for uh, the vector processor. So these are uh, essentially the uh, most significant differences between array processors and vector processors. Uh, the interesting thing here is that, let's say that this is like a kind of purist di distinction. So uh, real world uh, SIMD processors are a combination of both. And actually that's the case in, in GPUs as we will uh, continue discussing today and tomorrow. Let's very briefly compare and recall uh, what's very long instruction word architecture, also to understand what's the main difference between uh, SIMD, in this case, the example uh, will be with array processor, and uh, very long instruction world architecture. Recall that in VLIW, what we have is a very smart compiler that is able to extract parallelism, typically regular parallelism, from the uh, code and generate some packed instructions that contain several instructions, right? In this case, for example, in the same instruction, we have add, load, uh, move, and uh, multiply. And these four instructions will be executed in parallel in these four uh, processing elements that you can see in the slide. So the parallel, I mean, the concurrency here is coming from the execution of different instructions uh, on uh, different uh, processing elements. While in the uh, array processors, because they are SIMD processors, we have one single instruction, in this case it's a vector addition, and what we do is executing the addition for different elements in each of the four processing uh, elements. Is that clear? Okay, let's continue, let's go a little bit deeper. Uh, our first uh, example, and this is actually, uh, it's a still uh, sequential code, right? So, but it's a, a very good exam example of what is called a vectorizable loop. Why do we call this a vectorizable loop? Because, um, uh, we call it a vectorizable loop because uh, the, all, uh, all the iterations of the loop are independent. There are no loop carry dependencies. So I can operate in parallel on A0 and B0 and on A1 and B1, right? That's why it's vectorizable because I can easily convert this into something, some code that will be executed on a CIND processor. So in the uh, vector processor, we operate on vectors, not on scalar data, uh, related to what uh, he asked uh, before. And there are some basic requirements. There, uh, there is a need to be able to store and uh, to load and store vectors, and we do that in the uh, vector registers. Actually, uh, we are going to use uh, this nice thing today, and uh, we are going to uh, see the first example uh, very uh, right now. Uh, so we have vector registers. I already uh, mentioned or defined what the reg vector registers are. We are going to contain uh, different elements uh, coming probably from the same array uh, in these vector registers. And these vector registers are going to have one certain vector length. And what's the vector length? Recall the example that I gave you in the beginning. Let's consider vectors of one million elements. Unfortunately, we cannot have machines with 
one million uh, processing elements, but we can have uh, shorter machines and we will, uh, I mean, shorter machine, machines with a certain number, let's say 128, 256 uh, processing elements. And what we will do is using them at the same time. This is what we are going to call the vector length, okay? And uh, the, next, the next thing is that we will need to access memory. And we are going to access this memory with a certain stride. In principle, you can assume that this stride is one, like uh, as in the example that we uh, saw before, where we access A0, A1, A2, and A3. The stride between uh, these elements that are accessed is one, right? But we could be accessing A0, A2, A4, for example, and in this case, our stride uh, will be uh, two. You had a question. Yeah, right. um, the vector length, um, is the software vector length, so if I have a software or I'm writing something with a vector of size 1,000, would that be split on multiple vector registers or? That's a very good question. Actually, the way that we are going to do this will depend on the machine. For example, we will see the, the, the actually at, at the very end of this uh, presentation, and, and we are also going to cover this uh, tomorrow, but let me uh, very briefly explain you. Uh, some GPUs, for example, the NVIDIA Tesla GPUs that you're going to uh, read about in, the, in this uh, required paper for this week, uh, they actually have, let's say, kind of software vector length, which is 32, but the truth is that you only have eight functional units. So if your array is one million elements, you will go 32 by 32, but the hardware will be actually executing eight uh, by eight. But you will see an example later. Okay, let me uh, very briefly uh, explain a little bit better what this vector length and vector, well, at least vector stride is with this example. Uh, does it work? Yes, okay. So um, this is our memory. This is uh, address zero, this is address M minus one, and uh, we, we, we will use a certain vector length, okay, let's say 50, for example. And we have to set certain vector stride. This vector stride is going to be a register where we put one number, and this number means the distance between elements that are going to be accessed from memory. In the uh, ECS example, as I said before, you can consider that this vector stride is one. So if this vector stride is one, uh, and let's say our array A starts here, we are going to access this element zero, element one, element two, and so on, right? If we execute one vector load A, <coughs> What we will be doing, this is our vector register, and this vector register is divided into uh, several slots. For now, let's assume that the number of slots is V length, okay? So if uh, our stride is one, we will access address A, which is this one, A plus zero, and we will store it here, and then A plus one, so we will read this and store it here, and then A plus two, and so on, right? If we set the stride to, let's say, eight, we will access A zero, but then A eight, and then A 16. So the addresses that our load functional unit is going to generate are address A, A plus zero, A plus eight, A plus 16, and so on. So we will be reading this thing and put this here, this thing, put this here, this thing, put this here, and so on. Okay? So this thing is the stride which defines what's the distance between consecutively accessed elements. Okay, we will uh, continue talking about the stride later. Okay, there we are. Okay, so uh, le let's continue. A vector instruction performs an operation on each element in consecutive cycles. That's what we have seen in the, in the example before. But there is something good here. Recall, the operation that we execute on every element stored in a vector register is 
independent from uh, the other operations on the same vector register. So that's why we can allow deeper pipelines. Recall that uh, we have studied here the MIPS pipeline, for example, right? It has uh, five stages. We can have even uh, deeper pipelines, and that's uh, going to be uh, very good to increase in the uh, throughput of um, of the uh, machine. And why can we have these uh, deeper pipelines? Because there is no intra-vector dependence. So if uh, I operate on A0 and on A1, I can do it at the same time because they are not uh, dependent instructions. They are not dependent operations. So I won't have to worry about things like hardware interlocking, recalling the pipeline and this uh, lecture about pipeline issues, if you have two instructions that are depending on each other and they are executing in the pipeline, at some point you will have to uh, stop the pipeline, right? Well, to, to what is called a, a stall. And um, so we don't have to worry about this here. Uh, we don't have to worry about control flow because even though, so this is pipeline operating on different elements and it's one single instruction. There is no, there are no branches there. So we don't have to worry about them. We will use branches as well in uh, CMD programs, but the number of branches uh, will be uh, much smaller. They will be much more uh, unfrequent. And also the thing I already mentioned that calculating the address is very easy. Why is that? Because we are defining a stride and using this stride we calculate A, A plus one, A plus two, or A, A plus eight, A plus uh, 16, and so on, right? The good thing is that because we know exactly what are the addresses that we are going to access, we could be doing something uh, that, uh, like uh, prefetching. And what does prefetching mean? Have you ever heard about prefetching? This essentially means that if I know, probably you have, uh, some of you might already have used that in, uh, when programming in C. Uh, the thing is that uh, if you know exactly what you are going to access in memory, in, from memory in a certain number of cycles, you could, you could start the access already. Right? So here, and going back to uh, the example that we were discussing, I have one million elements I want to operate on, and I know that right now I can operate on 32, but after that I will be operating on the next 32. So while I'm doing the computation for these 32 elements, I can already be accessing the next 32 elements from memory. That's what is called prefetching, and there is a lot of uh, research uh, on this, uh, and, and, and this is something that uh, nowadays, all uh, computers uh, or all CPUs uh, include hardware uh, prefetchers. But this is, let's say, like more ab advanced concept in computer architecture. So if you are interested, uh, you can, uh, uh, you can uh, come to the uh, computer architecture master's course and the uh, bachelor course that uh, professor, the bachelor seminar that Professor Mudlu uh, teaches as well. Uh, is that a compiler level optimization or translation can that be done in hardware? That I can yes. So uh, either way, you can have software prefetching. Your compiler can I, I can detect that and can uh, generate these instructions, these load instructions, to go to memory and bring the data. Or even easier, if the hardware does this for you and for the compiler. That's a, actually the way uh, it is in, in in current CPUs. Okay, advantages of uh, vector processors. I think that this is something that we are uh, already uh, talking about. There are no dependencies within a vector, so pipelining and parallelization work really well. Deep pipelines, we were already mentioning that. Uh, each instruction generates a lot of work. One single instruction can be uh, useful to operate on, let's say, 32 elements or let's say, uh, 128 elements, depending on what's your vector length, right? Uh, and this is uh, definitely useful because remember that in this, uh, how, how was it called? The, um, in, how was it called in, in, in the lecture? The, the cycle, the, exec, the instruction execution cycle, right? Recall that the very first thing was instruction fetch, go into memory and uh, bringing the instruction from memory. So this is something that uh, here it's going to be much more efficient, right? We need to read, um, so the number of instructions that we need to read from memory is much smaller. Uh, if we have a scalar machine, 
and we have to operate on 50 elements, we need to go 50 times to memory to read the instructions to operate on these 50 elements. But if we have a vector machine, we only need to go once, right? So that's uh, why uh, here we say that we reduce the instruction fetch bandwidth. Um, also, regular memory access patterns. This is uh, what uh, it will be typically. Uh, we will define a stride, but after that, the accesses are always regular. And even though we don't really need to cover the reasons why, but uh, it's uh, much more efficient memory access. And then, uh, there's no need to explicitly uh, code loops. We will use loops, and actually we are going to see an example at the end of the lecture, but we will have fewer branches. In the end, uh, think that branches are not productive, right? They are, of course, necessary because we need them to control the flow of the program, but they are not really necessary. Uh, I mean, necessary they are, but they are not really productive, right? Productive is execution, ex executing additions or executing multiplications. That is really productive. But they also have some disadvantages. Disadvantages is that they are not good for exploiting irregular parallelism. And actually, uh, GPUs, for example, are not really very good at irregular parallelism. You can, if you're a smart programmer, you can figure out a way of extracting the parallelism and uh, still... Uh, uh, getting good uh, good speed up as compared to a CPU, but um, it takes obviously more uh, effort. And that's actually something that was already pointed out by Fisher uh, when he was working in, in this very long instruction war architectures and this paper published in ISCA 1983 where he said, to, vector a pro uh, to program a vector machine, the compiler or hand coder must make the data structures in the code fit nearly exactly regular, the regular structure built into the hardware, right? We need regular uh, data parallelism. And we need to be able to write the code in a way that we uh, access uh, this uh, regular data organization in an efficient way and we put it in the vector registers in an efficient way. And continue say, saying it's not only hard to do in first place, but uh, just as hard to change. That is, you might have written your code for, let's say, vector length equal 50, and eventually you need to change this because for some reason uh, the characteristics of your array change, right? So you will have to go and change the code. So this is one of the main disadvantages of these uh, vector processors. And they have more uh, limitations. They can easily become, so a memory can easily become a bottleneck. Why is that? Because I have a lot of uh, compute power already, right? In the examples that we are discussing here, we have, for example, four processing elements, and these four processing elements can be computing at the same time. So if I need to feed these four processing elements, I need to read four elements at the same time from memory, right? So I need, uh, I need higher bandwidth. And actually, uh, if you go to any of the, I mean, GPUs, for example, most of the workloads that we execute nowadays on GPUs, they are bounded by the access to memory, even though if you read the specifications, you will see that the bandwidth is uh, amazing, like, I don't know, 700, 800 gigabytes per second. It, uh, it still is uh, short for what the, um, the uh, computing elements of the GPU need. Okay, a little bit more in depth. Uh, now, let's talk about the vector registers. Each vector data register holds n m bit values. Let's say typical uh, values, if our vector length is 32, n will be 32. If we operate on 32-bit elements, uh, four-byte elements, like integer or floating point, they will be, this m bit will be 32-bit, right? Uh, and here you can see uh, three vector registers, vector register zero, one, and these will be uh, whatever, x. So, uh, and we also have uh, three uh, special registers, which are the control registers, vector length, we need to define what's the length uh, of the vector that we are going to operate on, the stride, which uh, we have already defined, and the vector mask. So, vector ma uh, so first of all, vector length can be a maximum of n. This is uh, something that we have uh, already discussed. In an example that we will see later, this vector length will be 50, but then at some point we will see another example where, where we will have to reduce this vector length 
to be effectively 15 in the, in the example that uh, we will show. And then we have this vector mask. Why do we need this vector mask? Because sometimes, unfortunately, we cannot exploit all the lanes or the functional units at the same time. And why is that? Because uh, life is not so regular, right? So we need to um, uh, somehow be able to decide when do we really want to operate on some specific data element or not. And that's why we need to use a mask. And actually, I'm going to introduce here a very uh, important concept that unfortunately, uh, Professor Mudlo, I think, couldn't cover when uh, he explained um, uh, branches, branch uh, prediction, and um, this lecture that we recently have, and it's called predication. And we are going to see why predication is important, because it's used in vector processors. Let's consider some uh, C code, some uh, high-level language, something like this. I have an if, and I have, let's say that we are going to operate on a vector processor zero, but for now this is just a scalar code, right? Just Sequential, sequential code. And if uh, V0i is zero, I will do this. If not, else, I would do that. You already know that the compiler for a sequential machine, for a SISD machine, will convert this into something like, for example, let's uh, invent some uh, some useful uh, ISA, for example, and branch equal zero. Branch equal zero will, this will be a, con a conditional branch, so uh, we will jump if uh, V0i is equal to zero, right? If it's not, we want branch and we will do this. But if it's, um, if it's not zero, we will go somewhere where the else label is, and we will do that. Of course, we also need some unconditional jump here, right? And after executing the do this, go to the end of the program. So how is this going to be executed on a SIMD machine? We, we, are not, we don't need to have branches like this one and this one. We are going to use Predication. And predication consists in having a, a special register called B mask, which contains one bit per functional unit. And the, the value of this bit obviously can be zero or one. And it will be zero or one depending on the predicate. What's the predicate? The condition here, the condition here. So V mask will be equal to zero or one depending on what's the value of V zero I. So for example, if uh, V zero zero is equal to zero, this will be, will be one. If it's, uh, the next one is equal to whatever, it's not zero, this will be zero, and this will be one, and this will be zero, and maybe this one will be one, okay? And then, we will execute, do this. But the hardware will only execute this, do this, for those lanes or those functional units where vector mask is equal to one. And after that, we will obtain the complement of V mask. So V mask will be zero, one, zero, one, and so on. And then we will do that. So this is how predication works. Oh, is that better? Very good. Okay, so this is how predication works. We will see another example at the end of the lecture and probably yeah, on tomorrow as well when we uh, talk about the GPUs. Okay, uh, we said we will have deep pipelines. Okay, something like this. So these, all these functional units, they will be pipeline. Why is that? Because they are in V1 and V2, I have the input operands 
in V3, I want to start the uh, result. Each of these V1, V2, V3 are divided into slots where I'm going to have these individual M bit operands. And in each cycle, I start executing uh, one multiplication in this example, so that in each of these pipeline stages, six in this case, I have the a specific uh, computation, whatever the stage is for uh, each of the operands that I have in the input registers. Okay? First uh, example of real world vector machine is Cray 1, which was uh, uh, released in the, in the 70s, uh, probably the first supercomputer, and it was the fastest computer of its time. Uh, observe that this is uh, in this uh, schematic, is schematic that we have here. Uh, we can see here the vector registers. We have also here some uh, vector functional units. Even this VM is probably the uh, vector mask. But also this machine, uh, it was the fastest, not only because it was uh, a vector machine, but also because it was the fastest scalar, it had the, the fastest scalar processor of its time. So you can, that's why you can also see here some scalar registers and some scalar uh, functional units. And why is that? Because recall Andal's, Andal's law. Uh, maybe your code is great, is uh, highly parallelizable, vectorizable. You can extract a lot of parallelism, regular parallelism for, from there. But uh, uh, if uh, some part of your program is inherently sequential and there is no way of parallelizing it, your Maximum speed up will be limited by Andal's law. You already know that. Uh, Seymour Cray uh, uh, also knew that, and that's why uh, he put a lot of effort on designing a very powerful uh, scalar core as well. If you want to see uh, Cray with your own eyes, you can go to CAP, uh, to the building where our lab is, and you will find this beautiful Cray XMP28. I think this one was built in the 80s, and also you can see next to it this uh, Raspberry Pi, which has exactly the same, around the same uh, po uh, computing power. So this is how we evolved. Um, and, and here you can see some, uh, I mean, there uh, next to the machine, you can also find the data sheet here. Uh, these are just some uh, uh, figures from, from it. Uh, in, in this particular case, observe that this one has four scalar CPU, so it was already multi-processor uh, or multi, not, not exactly multi-core, but multi-processor. And here you can see uh, uh, vector registers, scalar registers, functional units, etc. A little bit more information here for different models, the number of CPUs, uh, size of the memory, number of banks. We are going to discuss what the banks are uh, right now. And uh, more details about the functional units and even more about, yeah, so uh, mainframe, uh, input-output subsystem, and uh, storage device. So, and this is Seymour Cray, uh, the father of supercomputers, and uh, the nice uh, uh, thing that he said is, if you, are, if you were plowing a field, which would you rather use, two strong oxen or 1024 chickens. Well, it will depend on what your field is, right? It will depend on what your computation is about. Mm -hmm. If you have a lot of regular parallelism, you will probably go for this. If uh, you don't have so much parallelism, you, but uh, you need a lot of uh, computing power, you will probably go uh, for this. So I think that we are going to uh, stop here uh, for 10 minutes. Um, and we will start talking about the memory access, memory banks. Okay. Um, yeah, let, let's continue. We, we already um, uh, had 10, 10 minutes. Uh, we were here and now we are going to talk about how we access uh, memory and we will see uh, why we need memory banks and why we need to have an interleaved memory in order to have an efficient access to memory. Um, and that's uh, why, uh, the, the reason why is because we have vector loads and vector stores. So we need to access, be able to access many elements at the same time for read or uh, for write. Uh, for now, we are going to assume the simplest case, the stride is one, 
and uh, all the elements are going to be loaded into consecutive cycles, as you will see. And the way to uh, achieve this is by having these banks. By having memory banks, we are going to be able to access, to get from memory, one element every cycle. And this is something that without banks is not possible. And why is that? Because, unfortunately, accessing memory takes uh, usually much longer than one single cycle. This is how uh, a bank memory or interleaved memory looks like. Uh, instead of having one single uh, memory thing, a monolithic array uh, with one single uh, MDR memory uh, data register and MIR memory address register, we are going to have a number of banks. In this example, 16. And each of them, as you can see, has its own MDR and MAR, they still share uh, something, uh, some important components as the data bus and the uh, address uh, bus. So uh, let's uh, discuss how uh, we are going to access them. The first thing to, to think about is how, is, uh, the, uh, how are the memory addresses going to be mapped into these, uh, into these uh, um, uh, banks, right? Because if you have some sort of uh, monolithic memory, something like, uh, like this, let's say that this is uh, or memory, this is element zero, this is element n minus one, and uh, I know that this is address zero, this is address one, this is address two, and so on, and this is address n minus one, right? I have uh, my M, A, R, I have M, D, R, and if I want to read some specific address from memory, I will put this address in the M, A, R, and sometime later, I will get the value from later, uh, from, from the memory and uh, store it in the M, D, R. Uh, sometime later, uh, how much is? It's a memory latency, and this memory latency, it's going to be M, Cycle. So what's the problem here? The problem is that if I need to access 10 elements, I will have to uh, wait, I mean, I will have to wait in total 10 times M cycles, right? So the way of reducing this latency is by having a bank memory. And in a bank memory, I divide the monolithic array into something like this, as you also have in the slide. These are the memory banks. This is bank zero, one, two, up to, let's say, bank 15. Maybe we, instead of having uh, 16, we can have eight or we can have 32 banks, okay? And now the way that we are going to map the addresses into these banks is by doing it in an interleaved way. It's one possibility. That, this doesn't mean that always going to be uh, the case, but uh, probably uh, it will be the most usual case. So this way, address zero is here in bank zero, address one is in bank one, and here we will have address 15, and here the next address is address 16, address 17, and so on, right? And this is, this is address uh, 31. So each of these banks has its own MIR and MDR, MIR, MDR, MIR, MDR. They are sharing the address bus, they are sharing the data bus, and if uh, I want to access, let's say, 16 elements, and let's assume for now that, that our stride is equal to one, if I want to access uh, 16 elements, what I will do is, in the very first cycle, I go in, I'm going to issue the memory load for address, let's say, zero. So I will put address zero here, and I will start accessing this thing. How many cycles do I need to access this element in address zero? Well, maybe I still need M uh, cycles, right? But the good thing is that one cycle later, while I'm accessing this element, I can start the access for address one. And then I can start the access for address two, and so on. And if, for example, this M is equal 10, in cycle 10, or let's say this uh, is equal 11, in cycle 10, I will get the data element that was in address, or that is in address zero. And then I might issue uh, one more uh, data load, and here, one cycle later, I'm getting data element in address 
one. You see? So this way I can fetch one element every cycle. So after having paid, let's say, the latency of the first access, these uh, 11 cycles here, I will have one data element every uh, single cycle. You see? So uh, my bandwidth, it will be much higher. Uh, there is uh, another uh, advantage here. Uh, you know that to access uh, memory, I will uh, probably need some uh, address decoder, right? And with the address decoder, essentially, I mean, here I will have the address and then I will activate the corresponding address, right? Observe that this address decoder needs to be very, very big. So if it's so big, I will, uh, the, the latency will be higher, right? So if the latency is higher, this M cycle will be uh, a very a high number of cycles. But here, the address decoder is much smaller. So probably latency will be much smaller and probably also these M cycles will be uh, uh, lower than these M cycles here. So that's another advantage. Okay, let's go back to the slide. And here you see uh, one more picture, the memory, 16 memory banks, and here you can see on the uh, right the uh, other, the unit that we need to compute the address in vector machines. This is also very easy, very lightweight, because we usually have one base address and we start adding one stride. It was a stride one in our uh, previous example, but it can be uh, something different depending on the value that we put in this uh, special vector stride. Uh, what was it? Uh, a stride vector, or yes. Um, so, um, how, uh, what, uh, I mean, let's recap a little bit. Why do we, what do we need to get one element every cycle? First of all, in this example, we are considering a stride equal to one, because if we have a stride equal to one, we will have, we will be accessing address uh, zero here, address one, address two, and so on. So we can access all the uh, banks in parallel. Um, we need also that the consecutive elements are interleaved across banks, exactly as I was uh, already assuming. And another important thing is that we need that the number of banks is greater or equal to the bank latency. Observe that in the example that I uh, just uh, uh, gave you here on paper, uh, we are assuming a latency of 11 cycles, right? And uh, with these 11 cycles and 16 banks, we can get one element every cycle as, as soon as we start uh, uh, obtaining elements from the memory. Uh, now think that the, uh, instead of having 16 banks, we only have eight banks. What will happen? We wouldn't have enough number of banks to, to uh, compensate for the entire latency of the first access. So we would have started eight accesses to each of the eight banks, and still we'll have to wait three more cycles to get the first element from banks from bank zero. So in order to have uh, an efficient uh, memory access, we need to have a number of banks that is at least uh, as, uh, as high as the memory latency for each of the banks. That's one important consideration. Another important consideration is the stride. Observe that here we are assuming, we were assuming a stride one and we were assuming a um, interleaved uh, uh, layout, right? So with this layout, now let's consider that instead of accessing address zero, one, two, and so on, we need to, uh, uh, to access the stride is equal 16, and then we need to access address 0, 16, 32, and so on. What would be the problem? The problem is that all these addresses are here in bank zero, you see? So this is what we call a bank conflict. And the problem is that we cannot have accesses in parallel to different elements. We will need to first access zero, wait for the 11 cycles, and when we have uh, element zero, we go to address 16, wait for 11 cycles, and so on. So this is one of the drawbacks of having uh, banked memories, but uh, I mean, still there are ways of dealing with this, with this and we will talk about them uh, later. Now, let's continue with the slides, and actually we are going to uh, see some code, start uh, uh, studying some code. This is some uh, scalar code. Observe that in whatever ISA this is, we have 
uh, one vectorizable loop, and in this vectorizable loop, we are going uh, over two uh, vectors of 50 elements, and we are calculating the element-wise average of these elements and storing the result in vector C. If we uh, translate this or compile this into some uh, ISA or scalar code, it will be something like this. Uh, here, you can see, uh, first of all, move uh, to register 0, 050, which is the number of iterations, number of uh, times that we are going to execute this code. Here in register 1, the address A of array or vector A, R2 equal B, R3 equal C. We need, let's say, just one single cycle for all these, uh, for these four instructions, for each of them. And then we start this loop, right? And in the loop, the first thing to do, we assume that this is memory access, memory load plus auto increment. And we need 11 cycles for that. To go to memory, address uh, array A and read something into register 4, go to memory um, to address where, uh, that is stored in register 2, which is the address of register B, uh, vector B, uh, store it in, in register 5. Then we add these two. Uh, then we shift to the right. Then we uh, store the result. And here we evaluate this, uh, the value of R0, which are, uh, we are decrementing every uh, single iteration. And if it's necessary, we will jump and continue the execution for uh, 50 times, right? So this is the latency of all these um, operations, if, of the, all these instructions on a CC machine. Uh, if you count the number of dynamic instructions, the total number of instructions that will be executed here, it will be uh, 304. And uh, you can already also compute what's the total uh, number of cycles that we will need to execute this in a machine. If you do that, you will obtain that number, 2004 cycles. And this will be assuming that we have a monolithic array as, as the memory, one single bank because we want to be fair, and in the uh, vector example, we are going to use a bank memory. We, are also, we can also do the same and, and have a bank memory or interleaf memory for the scalar processor. Let's assume we have 16 banks. But here, if you go back, uh, you could have, for example, two accesses at the same time. If we assume that uh, array A is in bank zero, and array one is in bank one, uh, we are only be able to do two accesses in parallel, because that's what we have here. And uh, if you assume that, uh, you can calculate what's the total number of cycles, and you will see that uh, the, number, the value that you obtain overlapping the two uh, load accesses, as uh, you can do if you have at least two banks, um, you will obtain uh, 1,504 cycles. We assume 16 banks. I don't need to explain this because uh, I already uh, explained uh, it on paper. But if you have uh, any questions, you can, uh, of course, ask. And now let's take a look at what happens when we generate vectorizable code or vector code uh, for a, a Cindy machine. Our code will look something like that, right? Observe that first thing to do is uh, setting the vector length equal to 50. Let's assume that we can have vector length equal to 50. Okay, we can later discuss uh, what if you only have 32 functional units? Yes, of course, this is something that we can discuss and we will do it at the end of the lecture. But for now, let's assume that we have 50. Let's assume that, well, it's not, not, not assume, it's what we need for this code actually, because uh, in this for loop, 50 iterations, we are accessing always consecutive elements, so our vector stride is one. Then we have uh, in uh, here these two instructions are two vector loads. We go to array A or vector A, we read something and we put it in vector register zero. Then we go to B, read something, put it in vector register one. And then we have the vector addition, vector shift write, and vector store. Here, the, you have the latency of all these instructions. The first two instructions are scalar. They only take one single cycle. There is no uh, vector execution here. Why is that? Because we are, we are just updating one single register in the whole machine, right? Which is a VLAN or, or VSTRIDE. Uh, but the other instructions are vector instructions. And the way that uh, these vector instructions recall that slide where we have the different uh, functional units 
and uh, we somehow pipeline the execution of the different uh, for the different vector elements. Uh, what we need to do is the same as we were doing for for memory. We will have to pay the latency of the very first access the, uh, of, to memory or the very first computation for the first element in the vector array. And after that, we will be obtaining one new element or one new result every cycle. That's why uh, we have um, uh, this uh, in the case of the vector load 11 plus VLAN minus one. In the case of, for example, vector add four plus VLAN minus one, assuming that the latency of one uh, add operation is four cycles. And um, this is in total only seven dynamic instructions. So compared to the 304 that we had for the scalar code, only seven. So we only need to go to memory seven times to read an instruction. And uh, you will see that this is also uh, much faster. For now, we assume that there is no chaining. What does, does this mean? Uh, this means that we cannot uh, f uh, do data forwarding among or between different uh, consecutive instructions. We will see, um, we will see uh, in more detail later. So the, essentially this means that if I execute this vector load, first vector load, no. Okay, I execute the first vector load and then the second vector load. Observe that I, I need to execute both before doing the addition, right? Uh, but uh, the way that I execute these two instructions is by accessing memory. I need 11 cycles for the very first element plus one cycle more for each of the remaining VLAN minus one elements. This means that right after 11 cycles or la right after 22 cycles, let's say, I can have the uh, first element of V0 and the first element of V1. So this means that I could already start doing the uh, addition for this first element of V0 and V1. Uh, if I do that, I'm assuming that I have vector chaining. That's kind of data forwarding. So for now, what we assume is that we have to wait until the very first vector load has completely finished, the second vector load has completely finished for the 50 elements that uh, the uh, vector length, the length tells me, and only after that I can start executing the, addi the addition. And that's why this will be the timeline. This is the way uh, that we execute this, with that will take uh, two, uh, uh, 285. Let's uh, take a look here because it's going to be easier uh, if we look at the code uh, here. So can you see it? More or less. Uh, okay, I think this is better. Okay, so uh, look at the timeline. First of all, one cycle. This cycle is for what? For this move by uh, instruction, a scalar instruction, one cycle. Second cycle for the next uh, scalar instruction. And then I have first vector load. For the vector load, recall how we had to access memory. We put the address in the memory port on the, the um, MAR of uh, bank zero, and we start accessing memory. We need 11 cycles for the very first element. And then we will start obtaining one element from the remaining banks every cycle, right? And that's uh, VLAN minus one, which is 49. So this is what I need to execute this first vector load. Because I only have one single memory port, this means I only have one single MIR and one single MDR in each memory bank, I cannot start executing the second load until I finish with the first one. So that's why after that I will have 11 plus 49. And because we are assuming that there is no vector chaining, even though observe that here, we already have the first element from V0 and the first element from V1, we cannot start with the addition until we have finished completely with the two loads. And then we start four cycles for the first element of this vector add, 49 more for the remaining elements, VLAN minus one, and so on. So if you uh, calculate, you add all these numbers, you will obtain these uh, 285 cycles. Is that clear?
Any question? I think you, you will need to uh, think about this uh, yourself a little bit. And, um, and uh, yeah, I think that uh, if, when, when you think about the example, uh, you will see it very clearly. And it's very important to understand this very well. Okay, uh, now let's assume that we have vector chaining. That is, as soon as I get the element zero of V1 in this uh, example code that we uh, have here, as soon as I get it from memory, I can forward it to the next uh, functional unit, which in this case is uh, multiply. I don't even need to write to the vector register. I can directly forward it to the uh, multiply uh, unit. And when I'm done with the result uh, no, uh, here that I'm going to store in some of the slots in V3, I can chain and store in the, uh, so I start the computation uh, of the next addition. So if I do that, observe that the good thing is, as I said before, as soon as I finish with this 11 cycle, which correspond to the uh, load of the first element of the second vector load, I can start the addition. That will take four cycle plus 49, which is vector length minus one. And as soon as I'm done with this addition, I can start the next instruction, which is the shift right. You see? So this way I can reduce the number of cycles a lot. But I still observe that I cannot have accesses to memory in parallel. Actually, even here, this is a store operation, even though the result for the first element of the vector register is completely done here after executing the shift write, I have to wait a few cycles until I start the store uh, operation. And why is that? Because I have one single memory port in each bank. I only have one MIR and one MDR. Uh, the memory latency of 11 is because uh, after you read, you only have to wait, wait 10 cycles until you get the right? Until you get the right one. The 49, you mean? No, uh, the 11. And the 11. The first address is the MIR, it takes 10 seconds or 10 cycles until you get it up. Yes, so I had. Yeah, should you then be able to start um, putting the second addresses into the MIR of the second vector? Right uh, you need to have the you need to have the value in the the, the address in the MIR after you uh, uh, until you complete the entire uh, memory access. And just write a new one in no, the no, you you cannot let's say save those nanoseconds or whatever. For that, what you need is what uh, we are asking ourselves here, and uh, the way to do that is using. Let me show you the example using multiple ports. I have bank zero here, bank one, and so on, 15. Recall that for each of these, I have one MIR and one MDR. I have also for bank one, I have also for bank 15. And now what I could do is adding a second memory port, for example, with second MIR and second NDR. So I can be accessing memory two addresses from each bank at the same time. And this is the way that I can have, uh, I, I can uh, improve the uh, uh, memory access a lot. And that's what we have down here and that's why uh, uh, I still, I still uh, recall that we have one single address bus and one single data bus. So that's why uh, we can start this uh, second vector load only after one cycle after the first vector load started. But uh, using the second port here, uh, the second load port, because actually in this example we are considering two ports for load and one port uh, for stores, uh, we can start the second vector load. And also because we have vector chaining, you see how efficient we can execute uh, this code here, only 79 cycles, 
which is more than uh, or, or 19 times faster than the execution of the scalar code. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, let's continue. Questions. What if, question that you were asking before, what if the number of data elements is greater than the number of elements in a vector register? Because as of now, we have to say, okay, let's define vector length equal to 50, or let's, let's say a vector length is equal to 32, right? But now uh, we won't have one million uh, uh, elements, uh, so we cannot operate on one million elements at the same time, right? So what are we going to do? We will need to uh, break loops here. So if we, we have to operate on one million elements and the maximum vector length that we can have is 64, as is in this example, we will have to operate on 64, 64, 64. And now let's assume that the number of elements that we have to operate on is uh, 129. If it's 129, we will first operate on 64 elements, we will load, add, store, and then we will jump. We still need jumps, we still need branches uh, in the vector code uh, to operate on the next 64 elements. And finally, the last thing to do, because the total size of the array or the vectors that we are considering is 100, 29, we will have to change the vector length in my example to one in the example of the slide to 15 and then operate on this single element or these 15 elements, okay? This is what is called vector strip mining and the reason is uh, because it's some, somehow an analogy to uh, what is called strip mining in, in mining, which essentially means that if you have a mine and you want to uh, find gold, you will have to remove all the uh, dust and all the dirt that is, uh, I mean, rocks, etc., that are on top of the of the gold, right? In in our code, the gold are the 64 elements that allow me to operate on uh, the, uh, all of them at the same time, uh, taking advantage of all the functional units that I have in the system, while the dirt, what I really don't want to have are these only 15, which are somehow wasting the power of the, the computing power of uh, my machine. Okay, that was the first question. Second question, what if uh, vector data is not stored in a strided fashion? That's also a very important question, right? Because for now we are considering, okay, let's uh, have a very efficient access. So the, what we, let's assume that the vector stride is one, which means that we are going to access all the elements of the array, or I also gave you an example. Let's now assume that vector stride is eight. Okay, but it still is regular, right? So I know that I, can I have to access element uh, zero and then element eight and then element 16 because my uh, stride is eight. And recall that we could even prefetch because we could know that uh, we will be end up accessing element 32 and element 40 and so on, right? Uh, but this is not going to be the case in all, uh, in all codes, right? So that's why we need some way of um, using indirection. And this is what is called scatter and gather operations. I want to give you uh, very quickly an example of what a scatter uh, operations or gather operations are, and uh, one good example are a sparse vectors. What is a sparse vector? It's a vector, let's assume that I have this in memory vector called C, and it turns out that almost all the elements of this vector C are equal to zero except some of them, for example, this one is four, and then I have another one, it's uh, 10, and then I have uh, another one that is 50. And the rest of elements are zeros. So this is a sparse vector. So if I access it, let's say in a dense way, if I access it as if all the elements were useful, it would be a waste of time, right? And a waste of energy as well, because I would go over all the elements of the array, and maybe this array has one million elements and only three of them are useful, right? So, what should I do here? Let's assume that this four is in address uh, 1001, these guys are in address uh, 2050, and this address is 
3072. What I will do here is having a second array, let's call it D, it's an index array or vector, and this guy has three elements. And in these elements, what I have is the address of the elements that are different uh, to uh, uh, different than zero. So this element of D is pointing to this element of array C, this one to this one, and this one to this one. And if I want to do whatever with these three values here, the first thing to do is to access DI. And after having access DI, I will access array C. So if I want to get these four, I have to add Z, which is the address of array C, plus D0, which is C plus 1001, equal four. And for the next element, C plus D1, which is C plus 2050, which is equal 10, and so on, right? So these kind of indirect accesses are called a scatter or gather accesses. In this case, in particular, it's a gather access because I have this in memory and I'm gathering it. I'm reading from memory, okay? If, when I'm writing, I talk about a scatter. And this is uh, what you have in, uh, in the next two slides. So, uh, yep, this is an example of uh, gather. Uh, here, same as uh, in, in my example, D is the index array, C is the array that has the values that I want to access. That's why the first thing to do is uh, loading values from uh, the loading the contents of uh, array D, and with this array D, I do this uh, load indirect to access array Z. You see? And now, uh, yeah, uh, example of the sparse vector that I already gave you, and this is the same, but for scatter. Here, the uh, index vector, the vector D is that one. This is the data vector that I want to store. Let's call it B, for example. And this is the uh, vector C where I want to store. What I do is I take this 3.14, I go to the index vector zero, and I store this 3.14 in the address base plus zero being base uh, equal to C. Uh, the 6.5 is uh, in address base plus two, I store 6.5 and so on, okay? We need these uh, instructions as well. As you can see, the memory access here is not so efficient, right? Because for every single read or write, useful read or write, I need to access memory twice. But still, I, uh, of course, need it. And then conditional operations. We have already talked about that. Uh, conditional operations uh, is where we need to use the mask operations, where we need to use the vector mask. I already gave you this example as well. Uh, here, this code is even simpler than the one that I used because we just, uh, we simply have, uh, have one if. If uh, a i is, uh, is uh, not zero, then uh, I will do this uh, multiplication. If it's zero, I don't do anything. Yep. Writing, yeah. Gather, scatter, okay? Okay, so mask operations. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, essentially the same example that uh, I gave you before on paper. You see uh, for that particular code, uh, vector load uh, a from A, vector load from B, uh, I compute, I obtain the mask, and I will only execute this multiplication for those elements where we find the corresponding bit of, of the mask equal to one. If the bit is zero because uh, they don't uh, fulfill this predicate, then I don't execute the uh, multiplication for them. And here you have another example that is more similar to the one that I gave you with if and else, and essentially the same thing that we have already seen, compare and obtain the vector mask, compute whatever, do this, and then complement uh, V mask and then do that. Is that clear? Okay, yeah, and here you have the values of the vector masks. Uh, you, you can, you can uh, take a look. 
Uh, one more thing about uh, mask vector instructions, because maybe you are asking yourself, okay, how, how do we really execute that on the hardware? We already know the, this bit of the mask. If it's zero, we don't do anything. If it's one, we execute the multiplication or the addition. Uh, but how do we really implement that on the hardware? Well, there are two possibilities. The simplest one, which is less efficient, but is simpler, uh, essentially executes everything for uh, every single element, no matter if it, the mask that you can see here on the left-hand side is zero or one, you just execute only if the mask uh, is zero, you don't write in the output register. And if it's one, you write. Okay, that's the simplest implementation. Good thing that the hardware is simpler. A more efficient way, doing what is called the density time implementation. In this density time implementation, the first thing that we will do is going over the entire uh, vector mask and only issue the corresponding operation, let's say the addition, let's say the multiplication, for those vector elements where the mask is equal to one. That's why here uh, in the pipeline you only see C1, uh, so you only see Exactly, uh, C1, 4, 5, and 7, okay? Which one is better? Well, I, I hope that this one will be more efficient, right? Because you are saving cycles. You are not uh, doing computation for nothing. Uh, the drawback is that here, uh, the latency for one single addition or one single multiplication will take a little bit longer, right? Because you need to first go over the entire mask and, 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 and scan it, right? Inspect it before starting the computation. Okay, uh, some more issues to keep in mind. This is also something that uh, we have already discussed. Now we are going to uh, discuss it a little bit more with uh, an example, matrix multiplication. And uh, we have strides, usually, yes, go ahead. No, so uh, what's the total number of cycles that you will need to execute this thing here? And what's the total number of cycles that you need there? You need, okay, whatever is your, let's say four, is the latency? Four plus VLAN minus one, right? But here is four plus only the number of lanes or, or, or elements for which you are really operating, okay? Uh, okay, so let's go back to the, the, the discussion about the strides. Uh, recall the example. If our stride is one perfect, because I will be accessing one element in each uh, of the consecutive bands, uh, banks, but I already gave you the example. What if it's 16? We will have a 16-way bank conflict, which means that all 16 memory accesses will go to the same bank, right? So the latency will be 16 times longer. The total latency will be 16 times longer. Um, and this is always uh, something that is going to uh, happen if, uh, always, if the stride and the number of banks are not relatively prime. So for example, if my number of banks is 16, 16 is a power of two, right? So it's um, uh, the, the, the only divisor of uh, 16 is two. If I'm using, let's say, an odd number for the stride, let's say one, three, five, I will never have a bank conflict. So the, my access will be uh, maximum uh, efficiency. Uh, but if it's not, if they have some um, uh, divisors in common, for example, 10 and 16, I will have some bank conflicts. And, and that's uh, unfortunately, unfortunate, but that's the way it is. There are ways of dealing with this, as uh, we will describe uh, next. Well, uh, just uh, let me uh, give you a very uh, quick example. Uh, let's uh, consider the um, storage of a matrix, right? And um, we are going to, uh, so the storage of, the way that we store a matrix, which is a, a two-dimensional organization in memory, can be in two different ways, at least. Row major and column major, what does it mean? Okay, think about uh, memory. Memory, it's a, a linear array, right? No matter if we are using banks or a monolithic array, uh, memory, it's uh, actually uh, something like this. Right, this is address zero, this is address n minus one. 
And this will be address zero, address one, address two, and so on. And that's the way that uh, the different uh, locations or positions in memory are addressed linearly. But what if I want to store something like this, like a matrix with a, I don't know, row size equal five and column size uh, equal uh, four, right? Number of columns is four, number of, so uh, the other way around, number of columns is five, number of rows is four. How do I store them? Should I do it row major, which means that element zero, one, two, and so on are going to be stored like this? Or maybe should I use a column major layout? If this is, uh, because this is uh, element uh, four, this will be element five, this will be element 10, and so on. So another possibility would be to store here element zero and here element 10, and here, uh, so, sorry, element five, and here element 10, and so on. Depending on the way that I store this, I can do row major or I can do column major. That will depend on the machine, that will depend, might depend on the programming language as well. It depends. So for now, in our example, we are just going to assume that we use uh, row major. And uh, with this row major layout, uh, we are going to multiply two matrices, matrix A and matrix B. So you know uh, that uh, if we want to multiply matrix A and matrix B, what we really want to do is, what we, what we essentially need to do is calculating the dot product of uh, row times column. So I will have to calculate the uh, dot product of A0, which is the first row of, row, uh, of matrix uh, A, uh, times uh, the first column of uh, B, this B0, right? I, I do the dot product, I obtain a value, and, and I obtain the first element of matrix C, that is uh, the output. But now what's the problem here? The problem is that I will use row major or column major for both, right? So both are going to be uh, stored in memory uh, in the same way. And uh, if this is matrix A and this is matrix B and this is my memory, matrix A will start, for example, here. This is element zero, element one, element two, which is element zero, element one, element two. But for matrix B, that will start somewhere here. This is element zero, one, two, and so on. And maybe this one here is element 10, right? So I have element zero of matrix B here and element 10 of matrix B here. So I have a stripe. When I calculate the dot product of this thing and this thing, for A, that's good. I, I'm just accessing consecutive elements, so I'm accessing consecutive banks. But for B, I will have to access this element and this element, and probably they will be in different banks, but at some point, unless this stripe, which is 10, is relatively prime with the number of banks, I will have a bank conflict. I think that is something that must be uh, already clear, right? So using strides, unless these strides are relatively prime with respect to the number of banks, I will have uh, bank conflicts. Bank conflicts. So how can I deal with these bank conflicts? There are several possibilities. The, a straightforward one, let's put more banks. If we put more banks, what's the problem? My hardware will be more expensive, right? So probably it's not the, the best way to deal with it. Another possibility is uh, trying to find a better layout. And uh, it, this is not always possible, but in some cases it is. And this is important if you uh, want to be, for example, a good GPU programmer, because uh, there is uh, one very useful uh, type of memory in the, G in the GPUs, which is an on-chip scratchpad, which is actually a banked memory. And this is the typical thing that if you are a GPU programmer, you will have to uh, optimize and, and take into account. Maybe some of you, if you have already tried to program GPUs, you have, might have already deal with that. So uh, what I could do for that, uh, one, one way of optimizing the layout here and obtaining and having a better uh, memory access for matrix B, what I could do is transpose matrix B, and then I will obtain BT such that instead of having element zero and then element uh, 10 far away, I will have element zero here, element 10 here, element 20 here, and so on. And this will be one, two, etc. 
The good thing of doing this is that in memory, I will have element zero here, and this will be 10, and this will be 20, and so on. So now, my stride is one also for matrix B when I multiply this thing and this thing, okay? It's just one example of uh, possible, let's say, software optimization uh, to uh, have uh, a more efficient access to memory. And then there are also some uh, proposals, uh, hardware solutions, like for example, uh, something what, that was presented in this uh, paper by Bob Rao, uh, very, uh, um, very, let's say, seminal work in 1991. Uh, which essentially is doing some kind of randomized mapping. So you don't really know what bank you are accessing and uh, you have some, some kind of hash function that uh, for this address you go here and for the next address you go there. And the good thing is that the total number of bank configs for typical applications is greatly reduced. Uh, problem of having something like this in the hardware is that if you are the programmer and need to start trying to reason, okay, where is my address map? You don't know that, right? It's more, much more difficult to figure out at least. Okay, um, yeah, let's continue. We are, I think, uh, almost done with uh, CMD processors. Uh, just recall that the distinction between array and vector processor is uh, poorest dis disting distinction current uh, CMD processors like GPUs, they are uh, more like a combination of both. Recall also this slide, probably we will also take a look at this slide tomorrow. And uh, about how the instructions are really executed on the hardware. Uh, we have all, uh, throughout the whole class, we have been talking about the vector length, and vector length means the uh, um, vector elements that you can be operating at the same time, right? And one possibility is having something like this. I have a one single functional unit with a probably deep pipeline, and I start issuing operations uh, uh, through this uh, pipeline. First of all, I operate on A0 and B0 to obtain C0, and then uh, for uh, element number one, for element um, number two, and so on. The instruction is exactly the same. In this particular case, vector length is eight, uh, but what I'm doing is uh, obtaining one element every cycle. And actually, and in the example that we discussed uh, for this vector code is, the, is what we consider, right? Um, GPUs these days are more like something like this. They are still pipeline, but you not only have one single uh, you need, you may have more, let's say four in this example. So here, the good thing is that exploiting parallelism not only, or concurrency, not only in time, but also in a space, right? And this is how this functional unit might really look. Uh, you see uh, four functional units uh, uh, up uh, in the top, four functional units on the bottom. They might be, for example, addition and multiplication and observe that they have access to the same registers. This is called a partition register file. And essentially what this means is that in your machine, you have a lot of registers. And when you run your program, uh, you will need a certain number of registers. And what the hardware is going to do is say, okay, how many, what's my vector length? It's 50. Okay, let's divide the total number of registers by 50. And to each of these guys, I'm going to give the registers that they need. So that is why uh, in the end, what we are going to do is that um, uh, in this, all these lanes, which are the combination of all the functional, vertical functional units that we have together, we are going to be executing uh, vector for vector element zero, for vector element four, for vector element eight, and so on. And, and the elements of uh, lane one will be here, elements on, of lane two will be here, and so on. So it's somehow also interleaved, right? You can see it. And uh, we will take a closer look tomorrow at this slide as well, but this is how we are going to execute on this uh, type uh, of machine, this type of mix between vector and array processor. Here, uh, for example, we have our vector length is 32, but we only have eight units, right? So we need, let's say, four cycles to issue each of these instructions for uh, the um, uh, 32 elements. Uh, we will continue tomorrow. Thank you very much for your attention.